We're gonna we're live. We're gonna Wait, do this did you guys show do tonight. The, I was gonna ask you a question. You can't now because yeah, now we're live in front of everyone. No more private conversations. We're okay, live. public conversation. Public uh, did, conversation. Did you do the no. stories that I was gonna bring last week? Because I brought them this week. I no. don't know. Good. We'll find Perfect. out. I'm pretty sure no. <laughs> Perfect. Then everything's fine. Everything's under control. Everything's fine except me. What is with all of this? I'm waiting for a cue. Is there a cue? I don't know if there's a cue. Yes, people see us. They see us. There we go. It's live. So let's start in just a few seconds. Starting in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 766, recorded on Wednesday, March 20, 25th, 2020. Oh my goodness, I don't even know what day it is. I don't have a title for this show. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with snake venom, wonder chickens, and narwhals. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. We humans have gone, undergone more than 10,000 years of domestication since the initial age of agriculture. In that time, we've experienced, experimented with thousands of different societies and ideologies, invented many, many, many religions, constructed philosophies for all occasions, created political economic systems that span the globe, followed the scientific process to amazing peaks of knowledge and technology. We have largely mastered the natural world and are still working out the last few kinks in our ancestral ape essence of behavior. And yet, when everything seems uncertain, when our domestic bliss is challenged, when society's gears grind to a temporary halt and the restart appears uncertain, what is it that we reach for first to see us through? Toilet paper. The domesticated modern human does not want to go backwards, at least where our backsides are concerned. And the second thing that we reach out for, of course, is science. Uh, we do not legislate. We will not legislate, pray, mediate, meditate, philosophize, trade, or rate cut our way out of this. But we can science ourselves the blankety blank out of this crisis. And the first thing we reach out for when science is the answer to any question is This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back. We're here to talk about, well, yeah, science. science because yeah. It's usually what we do. It's usually what we do. We like to talk about it because science is interesting. Science fills the nuggets of your brain with information that allows you to make decisions, come up with new ideas conjectures yes it's so good it's so good ah, this week i have stories about some waves that's right ripply wave action i've got also some stories about life finding a way what did you bring justin uh let's see as you have uh, let's see i've got a wonderful chicken story I've got an ancestor to all animals, an ancient skull that's got some interesting uh, implications for early hominid evolution, and COVID-19 debunking. Okay. Rips lab. Nice. I can't wait. Let's get into that. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, I have some new Aesop's fables, and that's all I'm going to tell you. 
Okay. They, how can there be new ones? Did they? Oh, they discovered an ancient vault. Either oh, they they there was some that no, were written like in between Blair pages. No, they're like Blairsops fables, I guess. Blair they're Sops like your new oh. one. Nice. I was yeah. thinking reincarnation. Oh, I'm really excited. Oh, oh yeah. Reanimated Aesop comes back with more fables. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. No. It's time for the science, though. And as we jump into it, I want to remind all of you that if you are not yet subscribed to the This Week in Science podcast, it's a podcast. So you can find us all places that podcasts are found. Look for us on Google or Apple or Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, Radio.com, TuneIn, you know, all those cool places. You can also find us on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science or go to twist.org. Okay, first up is the weekly COVID-19 update. Now, I know Justin just said he was going to do some COVID debunking. I wanted to jump in on the conversation around hopeful drugs for treatment. Great. Ah, yeah, that's a good one, too. Yes. So you may have heard in the media or from our president's tweets that there are some drugs that are going to help everybody. And they're so promising. Very, very promising. Incredibly promising. So, well. They're beautiful drugs, I've heard. They're beautiful, beautiful drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So there are a lot of beautiful drugs out there. Chemistry is gorgeous. Looking at molecular structures, oh my goodness, these things are amazing. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts... Things that are similar are not the same. <laughs> Just going to put it out there, you yeah. know. So there are some drugs that have been shown in non-clinical trials to potentially work. There have been um, anti-malarial drugs that have been purported to work in China. One drug called chloroquine, another drug called hydroxychloroquine. And some uh, and additional drugs that work in concert potentially with these anti-malarial drugs. And these drugs get off-label use a lot, but they come with terrible side effects. And if you don't get the dosages right or the exact molecular combination of drugs like hydroxychloroquine and maybe the stuff it's mixed with, you can die. And so... You may have heard that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are very, very promising, beautiful drugs, etc. And they are, but you should not be stockpiling them because the promise is based off of, especially for hydroxychloroquine, when used with azithromycin, which is an antibacterial agent, um, to treat COVID-19. The paper that it's being based off of is out of a study done in France that was an open-label, non-randomized clinical trial. And this protocol that they used, so non-randomized, they used uh, patients who they could have been any severity of disease of COVID-19 from extremely severe to really mild symptoms. It doesn't really, uh, they didn't really determine that in the study. They only used a small number of patients. So the total number of patients that were used in the study was something, uh, it was something like 42 patients, um, 22 of whom had respiratory problems and six of which were asymptomatic. But were they even all tested for COVID or did, was it symptoms like? You no, know, they were all, so they were all tested. They all had okay. COVID, okay. but uh, it, the severity of the symptoms were not part of it. So 20 cases were treated in the study and they showed apparently a significant reduction of the viral carriage at six days post uh, post-treatment compared to controls. And that is promising, but I'm just going to put it out there that when you're looking at 20 people, that is a very small sample size to be determining your potential for use off of. Really, that's more of a does it make people more sick kind of study. This well, is the isn't, first line. Isn't reducing viral load kind of a tough thing because... Mm -hmm. It depends what happens after that. Like, are and what, you 
are you going to actually accelerate a new strain by doing that? Because you're but there, cutting but the it, thing, but you're not. Right. Yeah, but the other thing, they're reducing the viral load. They're they're basically doing an averaging. It's a, mm -hmm. on average, the viral load of the treated group was lower than the viral load of the not treated group. They're not showing that before treatment, this particular individual had a certain concentration of virus, and then after it changed to this. They weren't doing very specific comparisons. And so that in itself is, it's misinformative. Yeah. Really. Totally. It's putting everyone into, everyone into a bucket together. But, um, well, yeah, yeah, this is this is one of those things that when we talk about finding a correlation is mm -hmm. a good place to uh, build a next hypothesis out of, out of it's and like then the go and do of a study. It's not the end of a study. Correct. Yes, so, correct. that's exactly and, what it that's and, exactly what it this is the this where where the tweets and the, the press conferences have said this is very promising. This is yeah. what it means so, to sign very promising to scientists is. Let's study this more. Yeah, maybe in a year, <laughs> if you're well, lucky. And it's we'll not, have it's not data for you. Uh, okay, because, but this is this is not a problem within science. This is obviously this is a problem with the perception of what it is that scientists do, because most yes. people's scientific education leaves off with a series of laws that can be tested over and over again, and they're always correct, and it's always true mm. that F equals M e M A equals M C squared. Like these, there's these laws that you learn and science is like, here's how you measure and this is the result, boom. Most of science is about tracking down an elusive prey uh, by, by disproving things over and over and over and over again until you narrow down what it isn't. And then you can start to formulate a, a pretty clear, a pretty clear eyed idea about what you're dealing with, what mechanisms are involved. So. Yeah, when when uh, the general public follows along with the bouncy ball of science, they're going to jump to lots of conclusions, uh, as as I like to do myself on the show from time to time. But that's you know that's that's a, a science uh, how science works scientific process education thing that the entire world needs still. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a big. I think that's a really important point to make is that this is still a an area of where science communication needs to work yeah. that education of the scientific process so that people understand that one study even that only has 22 you know tested <laughs> on a certain drug that's mm -hmm. a small sample size and that isn't something to base all of your decisions off of it's especially well, that's a good not to something to jump off you know jump off and take your your fish cleaning Oof. Stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. Stuff. Wait, so, wait, is that what? Because I was already, wondering, wait, wait. there's already somebody who died as yeah. a result of taking a hydroxychloroquine compound because it is the same compound that's in a fish tank cleaner. Oh, because I was wondering, like, how are people getting these drugs that they're just testing out? Like, how are people getting yeah, a hold so of? So, actually, the uh, reality of how people are getting a hold of it and stockpiling it is that people are uh, getting their veterinarians to prescribe they are getting um they are actually there is an a, an uptick of pharmacists talking about doctors calling their offices with patients who suddenly have autoimmune diseases where they've never treated patients with autoimmune diseases diseases before because these drugs are also used to treat autoimmune diseases so now people with autoimmune diseases with malaria with other issues are no longer able to get the drugs they need because there's a run on them because people are stockpiling them because they're telling their doctors they need them. Okay. Well, there's there's a form of natural selection taking place then. Uh, you know, we, we think we think that's not a, a force in our society. We're wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, the other thing about is this new fitness. is that there's lots of talk about pushing things through FDA and, and trying to get stuff approved to be used kind of as quick as possible, which I like anyone else would like to exit my home and go back to normal and be able to just take something and be good for COVID. But that's, that's not the way it works. And sometimes it sucks, but we got to be a little patient to make sure things are safe. Well, I, I would disagree with you there. 
Uh, on the and and and, and uh, normally I would a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, in a cl- case of a global slowdown where everybody's uh, stuck indoors, the the pushback is going to be people just say forget about it. I'm going back to normal life. So I think I think you do need to accelerate it. I think there's enough uh, people who are in this condition. It's you know thousands globally that you you take not just the last arrow in the quiver, you take the first arrow in the quiver too. Uh, and you try it in small groups. Think of this you try more it in like small groups. In you small don't let everybody do a run on it. Yeah, no, but not anyway. every part of getting things certified is doing well, trials. But and, let's yeah, move but, on to other science, though. But accelerate it. Uh, Excel- we should best. accelerate things. Yes. There, there is a there is an impetus for acceleration, but at the same time, yeah, safety so mm-hmm. that people who wouldn't otherwise die don't. Yes, and and <laughs> just by the way, with the last moment, poofing, which is what. This is like a, it's a real estate term. When you are poofing, you're like this rare gem of a fixer upper. When you're, that's uh, something called poofing in real estate, where you are mm. saying really positive, you're shining a, a thing that normally you wouldn't shine. Okay. Um, this is shining the bright, world that our, our, the current uh, resident in, in the White House is, is used to talking. In. He's, he's a poofer. A, he's a poofer, <laughs> and so <laughs> poofing does not work when it comes to science. Poofing is actually uh, destructive when it comes to science and making medical decisions and these sorts of things. Yeah, the, in- the, incredibly. The, the, yes, uh, in real estate, it's fine. In marketing, that's what you do. Uh, the reason that he's doing such a terrible job with this is that it's against every one of his instincts and uh, dealing with yeah. something like the. Like the real, real world of science and this is I, is this is this a bumper sticker or a T-shirt that I need? No <laughs> poofing in science. <laughs> no poofing in stop. Nobody poofs in science. That's not. It's what like we Tom do. Hanks though, because it's like Nobody no crying poofs. in baseball. It's no poofing in science. No Nobody, poofing in science. No people. poofing in science. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving into some other science news. Big, exciting, what I think is really exciting and interesting news out of MIT. Researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have been looking at starfish eggs. Because who doesn't want to look at starfish eggs? Well, starfish eggs are eggs. They're cells. And we can look at them. They're very, very small. You look at them under a microscope. But these researchers wanted to observe the process that takes place on the outer membrane of the starfish eggs, or really, this is modeling any egg in the animal kingdom, when fertilization takes place. So they've discovered that there is, researchers hit before them, discovered there's a particular protein that gets released and gets knocked into the membrane. And when it does, it starts a whole cascade of events that take place that lead to activation that basically forms an impermeable coat over the egg, around the egg, so that the egg immediately locks out any other sperm that might want to get in there, and it starts the process of cell division. The researchers, Nika Fatri and Thomas D. and Virginia uh, Cabot, they started looking into this and found that a wave pattern emerges that is incredibly gorgeous. I'm going to try and uh, share this on my screen. What they found in looking at this wave pattern is that it's very fractal in nature, and the waves that are generated are very similar in the physics of how they form in swirls that interact with each other to other mediums, liquids like air and water that also have waves. And so in finding this, they thought it was, and I agree, it's incredibly fascinating that at this basic level of biology, there are similar physical features and mechanisms to things we see at much larger scales in action in all sorts of different mediums. 
And so what they're thinking is that now taking a closer look at the physics of how these waves spiral and form and interact with each other, they might be able to create models that can even help us in our quantum computing, which is an incredible jump to make. But because of the way that they form and the way the waves act, there are similar waves, quantum waves, that uh, they that they could apply it to. Now, what's incredibly interesting, I, I just, the whole thing is just boggling my mind that they're, first, we've known for a long time there are these waves that coat the whole surface, the membrane of these eggs in the process of readying the egg for for its cell division. But beyond that even, it's the kind of that cascade of molecule to molecule to molecule. And when one molecule, they, the anecdote or the analogy that they came up with is like if you're looking at a, <laughs> a fish tank, that hasn't been cleaned in a while. And you can't really see beyond it, but there's a fish in there. And then suddenly that fish swims up to the surface and you see the whole fish. It's kind of like what happens. There's this protein that hangs out in the middle of the egg. And then when the sperm gets in there and activates the protein, it comes up to the surface of the membrane and starts this entire cascade of events that create these spirals and whorls and waves that lead to an, an organism. It's magic. <laughs> it's biological magic. It's, 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 but it's not magic. It is physics. It's chemistry. It's biology. And it's, it, it puts it all together in such an amazing, amazing picture. It's a biological lava lamp. <laughs> it's mesmerizing. I'm like rising. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's just this, uh, this, this amazing. Uh, all I can use is are words like fascinating, amazing, <laughs> because it's just my, it's blowing my mind. Far out, man. Trippy. Far out. Exactly. Um, and seriously, if part of these spirals and the way that they work. Part of their function is to determine where the center of the cell is so that division can take place. That's like that's why they spiral in the way that they do. If they didn't interact with each other and like like any waves, the ones that run into each other cancel each other out. The ones that continue forward, you know, they move on and and there are additive waves as well. So it's just like the wave actions that you may, may have studied in your physics class or will study in a physics class. But the whole process is determining that center line hmm. for symmetric, symmetrical organisms so that that division, cell division can take place around the center point from that point forward. Mm. I, I know, right? That, yeah, I'm, now I want to know <laughs> if that's conserved anywhere else in nature. Yeah. Right. There's a, cha a comment in, in YouTube saying emergent properties. And it is. It is. It's a physical emergent property that leads to the division of, an organ of a cell that leads to an organism. So it, it is a bit like that. It's an emergent property. But yeah. Beauty. And it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Mesmerizing like a lava lamp. What do you have, Justin? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Is that my uh, uh, find out? I have the oldest fossil of a modern bird uh, ever found. Oldest? Tell me about it. He, he's frozen. He doesn't want to tell you. Oh, I thought it was me. The <laughs> The fossil concludes a nearly complete skull that was hidden inside a piece of rock about the size of a deck of cards and dates from uh, one million years before the asteroid impact, which eliminated all the big dinosaurs on the planet. This is published in the, natural, uh, nature, uh, the journal Nature. The team was led to Cambridge. They believe the new fossil helps clarify why birds survived the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period while the giant dinosaurs did not. 
detailed analysis of the skull that show, shows that it combines many features with a modern chicken and duck-like bird, suggesting that Wonder Chicken is actually uh, close to the last common ancestor of both ducks and chickens. Fossil was found in a, uh, the Belgian Dutch border. Deck of card sized rock. Uh, those already were sort of interesting because they look like bird fossils, and those are extremely rare at that point in Earth's history. So they didn't open it, they didn't open the rock. It's too dangerous. Instead, they used X ray CT scans and they peered through the rock and got 3D imaging of what was right below the surface. Millimeter beneath the rock uh, was the find of a lifetime, they say. A nearly complete 66.7 million year old bird fossil. This is Quoty voice of Dr. Daniel Field, Cambridge's Department of Earth Sciences. The moment I first saw what was beneath the rock was the most exciting moment of my scientific career. This is one of the best preserved fossil bird skulls of any age from anywhere in the world. We almost had to pinch ourselves when we saw it. I was excited, <laughs> doesn't it? Knowing that it was, yeah, knowing that it was from such an important time in Earth's history. The ability to CT scan fossils like we can at Cambridge's bio uh, more, uh, biotomography center has completely transformed how we study paleontology in the 21st century. Because you can imagine this thing's only a millimeter uh, underneath the rock when, once they scanned it how easily they could have damaged this fossil. Oh, man, uh, you got to be so delicate. Yeah, uh, it would be a you know very difficult task. And it makes me sort of wonder, like, how many good fossil finds in the past were destroyed because they were just too del uh, delicate? To I often to. think about how archaeologists and paleontologists, they must walk around with, like, pillows strapped to their feet. <laughs> 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 just kind of like... Ugh, ugh. I don't want to hurt anything. <laughs> yeah, this is a, they say this was a very, uh, a small bodied ground dwelling bird that likely lived near a shore. Uh, Asteronis, they're calling it, which is <laughs> and, uh, named after, I think it's a Greek uh, mythology goddess who, who's also asteroids are named after because she had something to do with them. Stellar. It's intriguing. But uh, yeah, like goddess of falling stars. Wonder chicken. Oh, the wonder chicken. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> and then, and then uh, right behind that, I have not just the ancestor of all birds. I have the ancestor of all animals. Geologists at UC Riverside have found the first ancestor on the family tree that contains most familiar animals today, including, of course, humans. But uh, this isn't. So early multicellular life uh, was uh, in in semi-scientific terms, wonky shaped. Uh, sponges, algal mats, they sort of grew in different directions and there wasn't really a front end or a back end and that might not even be the right question to ask uh, when looking at one of these things. But most animals we know of today have a front, uh, back, they have symmetrical sides and they have an opening uh, with some gut going to another opening somewhere on the body. Uh, they found what they think is the earliest example of this. So for 15 years, they have been seeing fossilized burrows. This is a, a 555 million year old uh, deposit in South Australia. And they've got these little burrows, they've got these little tracks, but there was no sign of the creature that had made them. Scott Evans, recent doctoral graduate UC Riverside, and Mary Drosser, a professor of geology, noticed minuscule oval impressions near some of these burrows. Uh, so they did some three-dimensional laser scanning that revealed regular consistent sh shapes of what would be a cylindrical body with a distinct head and tail and some faintly grooved uh, muscular, uh, musculature indentations there. I think this animal ranged between 2.7 millimeters uh, to about down to one, uh, two, uh, one to two and a half wide. So uh, tiny, a, yeah, it's a little, a little tiny thing. 
Yeah. Uh, the, the, the largest, large end of that's about one uh, grain of rice. So that's what they figured it would have to have been. Uh, they thought the animal, we thought these animals could have, uh, should have existed during this interval, but always understood they would be difficult to recognize. Once we had the 3D scan, says Evans, we knew that we had made an important discovery. We pinched us. No, they didn't pinch themselves. That was the other thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is sort of a, a, a discovery of a, this is the critical step in sort of getting what became the, the, the structure or platform uh, for what all animals eventually evolved from uh, after that. These the first little teeny little... tiny tiny worm. Mm hmm. He's got and a cute he... name Icaria Wariutia. Wariutia. <laughs> Earliest <laughs> bilaterian. Okay. Hmm. I don't know. I just keep going back to the image, and the image, it really. Looks like a d detachable penis. <laughs> it's there's something about Wait, it. Huh? Sure. Wait, what's a, a disembodied, a, d there, a disembodied I just, I just, to penis? Clarify, except for the fact that it's entirely too small to be that. It's, the artist's picture. It's got. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You know. Uh, I think you should talk to Marshall before <laughs> you publicly <laughs> identify things. No, Keith like, referencing like the famous song. That's yes. what it's about. Yes. <laughs> what are you people talking about? I it looks to me like a, 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 a fat little sea dwelling worm. It's, it does kind of look like um, hagfish and stuff like that because those are yeah. kind of the the um, the jawless fish that were that are very similar to what we assumed were the ancestors of all chordates and vertebrates and all that stuff. So it's definitely it kind. It looks similar. Just it's like if that and a worm were crossed, kind of. Yeah. But but this is five hundred fifty-five million years ago, and I think this before uh, worms. Thing, this thing that was on this in the sand on the ocean floor was looking for organic matter to put into a gut that went from one end to the other. Uh, they think it had rudimentary sensory abilities to be able to find that organic material. Uh, so. Yeah, this is a this is a pretty they think they they think this is you know this is mouth, gut, anus, bilateral like symmetrical. This is this is bilaterally this is, symmetric. Yeah, this is the yeah. this is the great ancestor. Right, but of, so that does not include sponges or jellyfish or those would have been older. Uh, right. Those would have been the first. So this is after that. So this yes. isn't. It, it's not all it's animals, but it's most. <laughs> No, it's animals, so it's not the sponges. So the sponges and jellyfish are like the first, but this is the first that's actually related to all animals, that they think yeah. is related to all animals, as opposed to this distant relative right. Right. that's not like actually on the same branch. I see. Yeah. Of the phylogeny, yes. And, and here's the, yes. the other interesting thing. If this is the first animal... 555 million years ago. You remember, this is a this is a four and a half billion year old planet. We're all still just getting here. Okay, but it's not the first animal because um, sponges and cnidarians came before these guys. Well, it's it's what you call an animal. We're talking about we're yes. The, so it's the first. It's yes, the first sponges and. Sponges, right. like okay. I said, sponges and Nadarians came first, but if they were off on a different branch, this is the first directly related animal. This right. is the so, first directly yeah. related ancestor to all animals that we have found at 550 right. million years this ago. This is the earliest well, I'm just, animal. I'm just trying to make the distinction that there is something that we haven't found yet, hopefully. That's in between. Behind. Yes. That, that that's in connects. between the Nadarians oh. and this tube worm yes, thing. Because yes. Because sponges so, and Nidarians are also animals. So I just kind of wanted yes. to make that distinction. Okay. So this is animals with a separate mouth and anus is yes. a, a distinction of animal. Yes. yes. So I just kind of wanted to clarify. That's <laughs> so good. Yeah. As, as a zoologist, you got to keep us honest about yeah, the anus. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's the oldest thing, but there will be an older thing, hopefully at some point that we find that connects all of them. Yep. Hmm. Good point. Very good.
Well, as we end this story, I think this is starting to bring us into Blair's Animal Corner. And as we get there, I just want to let you know that this is This Week in Science. And if you would like to help help this podcast out, get a friend to subscribe to Twist today. That easy. And now is time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? <gasps> oh my goodness, I have my... Bla- Blair Sops fables today. Yes. I'm very excited. Like Bring them. <laughs> Tell us um, a story. So the first one is why the snake bites with venom. So this is a conversation that that we we've kind of talked around before. The fact that some snakes have venom when they bite. Most of them do not, but some do. And there is kind of a, a couple different realms of thought as to why they have venom. Now, I, as a, a educator in conservation and animal stuff, <laughs> have always been a proponent of the theory that venom is for prey. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that snakes sometimes give a dry bite. So they wouldn't do that if they, they wouldn't dry bite somebody that was near them, a human, if they were trying to use venom to scare away people. But also we know from previous studies we've talked about that there's actually a predisposed fear of spiders and snakes in us when we are babies. So just the body shape of a snake is enough to keep us away in theory. But there are still some people that think that venom has something to do with defense. So this is a new piece of research looking at venom as either a defense mechanism or as something to immobilize prey to eat it. So knowing that sometimes snakes release venom when they bite people, and sometimes people are hurt, unfortunately, sometimes people are killed. Most of the time, not, but it happens sometimes. Um, So knowing that, uh, how do you measure the reasoning behind why venom exists? Which you can get into kind of this like chicken and egg conversation pretty easily, but- <laughs> but <laughs> the uh, the way that this uh, student, actually an undergraduate student who ended up publishing their work, which is very cool, um, did this study is they actually gathered online survey responses from, you guessed it, reptile keepers, people who've been bitten by snakes. <laughs> so this is reptile keepers, herpetologists, and field workers. They gained nearly 400 responses, um, cataloging around 600 experiences, so do the math there, um, of bites of venomous snakes on humans. And what they asked was about the time course of pain after bites have been sustained. So the reason to look at that is that if it's being used as a defense, there would need to be pain. Because if there's not sufficient instant pain, that will not deter a predator from leaving the snake alone long enough for the snake to escape. So a bee sting hurts so that the bee can get away. The idea is the snake would be biting the pain would make you go, ah, and then let the snake run away. So looking at that, they found that there is very little evidence for widespread evolution of venom in defense because there's not a lot of pain immediately involved with these bites. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, a minority of bites and species caused rapid, severe pain. Um, And so that means it seems like this is not a defensive trait. This is something that because they're biting, because they're an animal and they bite when they're scared, but they also have venom glands and those channels in those fangs, 
sometimes you get injected with venom, <laughs> which kind of follows with the co with what I brought up before, that sometimes you can get bit by a venomous snake and they don't inject venom in you at all because they don't want right. to use it on you because it's a waste. Venom's really hard to make. It takes a lot of energy. So they don't want to waste that on something that isn't a meal. It makes perfect sense to me. It's what I've been preaching for years. Um, but so the... <sighs> it would appear based on this specific data point that the, the, the reasoning behind the venom is for diet. That would be the main driver of developing venom in snakes. And so it kind of, it adjusts how we, how we study snakes to a certain extent, how we study their venom and their, their kind of their, their load bearing of venom, how much they carry. Um, it would make sense based on that as well. I mean, the the animals tend to have more venom if they eat larger prey. So it makes sense to me, but it's nice to kind of see there's being some, A, that there's a study that was um, carried out and published by an undergraduate, which is really cool. But also that um, people are doing research on snakes and their venom, not just in order to... Um, kind of understand the venom itself, the chemical properties of the venom, but the reasoning behind it. Because it also, I feel like, takes some of the stigma away, potentially, from snakes as a whole, which are just pretty under misunderstood as in are they? the wild. Yeah, absolutely. People are try they? to get rid of them. They try to chop them in half. They try to remove them from their garden, when actually they're providing really important ecosystem services. Okay. Right. Their ecosystem uh, service to help get rid of rodents yeah, and exactly. other things. That's fantastic. Yeah, I also yeah. don't and want I, you biting me that. or my I'm, child. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is the part. You said that children uh, show a natural fear towards yeah, snakes. Yeah, we did that story on the show <laughs> last year. Who yeah. tested that? I don't remember how, how they did it. They did it with pictures, babies right? To see if babies get scared of snakes. Uh, yeah, Stop I think that's, that's a great question. Pictures? Stop that one. Yeah. Anyway, Stop that one. I'm all for every kind of say. Stop putting snakes near babies. So that why did know, the snake but... get its venom to kill its prey before it ate it? Okay, so the next one. Well, well hang on, hang on. Uh, uh, just I will say one thing on this too. There's uh, yeah. I was watching something about the uh, is it the banana slug? Is it a, a North American banana slug which doesn't live anywhere near bananas because it's way up in the like in the redwoods, yeah, and it has. A banana. Yeah, and it has this anesthetizing thing that it excretes. And so a snake will, like, devour it. And then, oh, like, its jaw stops working because it's been totally anesthetized. And the they both end up dying, I think, at the so end So this, this is the difference between poison and venom, though. So this is part of the main difference is poison is ingested and venom is <laughs> injected, right? And right. so the difference for motivation is part of it as well when you talk about biology a lot of the time you'll say that poison has to do with self-defense and that venom has to do with um pursuing prey so it kind of falls with that uh theory as well um but yeah so the poison the poison is is often also paired with coloration so for example the banana slug is bright yellow to say hey don't eat me i'm poisonous and so it might take one dead slug to teach the species as a whole or to encourage see, see that's all, and that's the that's the know, part that i'm curious kind of about heard yeah that's the part i'm curious because there, there, there's not another snake around to see it and i don't know if a snake learns from another snake's behavior because in a sense then you're talking about you know what anything that kill, eats our species should just die so anything that's attracted to us and we'll just weed them out through natural selection over time by every time one that thought we looked tasty died there's another one that didn't think we look tasty and they'll continue to breed. So I was wondering if the if the self-defense mechanism for uh, snakes might have something uh, in that line too. So I think the other difference there too is that with poison, um, it causes one of two responses. You barf up that stuff right away or you die. <laughs> Venom doesn't cause either of those things when it is being used for defense usually if you get bit by a venomous snake unless it's a very particular venomous snake you are likely to get better okay. so that is the difference. if a rattlesnake bites me what happens i don't know it depends really if don't. it's a sidewinder you're probably fine if it's a diamondback you need to go to the hospital you, you need to go to the hospital either way but really okay. um it depends on the on the snake but there's lots of snakes out there that are venomous that 
aren't necessarily going to kill what they bite. So that is why that's kind of another thing is if it's not causing immediate pain mm -hmm. and it's not going to kill you, then why would you be injecting that with venom? To keep it, can it slow it thing down so that it just doesn't wiggle while they swallow it? So when, yes, when they're eating things, yes, yes it immobilizes the thing it's about to eat. So that's exactly it, right? So it's, it kind of- I worked on the mouse, I'll try it on the herpetologist. I mean, also think about venom and spiders. They do that to, to eat mm -hmm. their food as well. So anyway, um, so that's why this, the snake got its venom, at least we think. Um, <laughs> next, the question is, why does the narwhal have a tusk? Hmm. So this is a study from Arizona State University and narwhals. Uh, one of my favorite animals to talk about on the show because they're just, they're full of interesting information and mystery. Um, but they have these tusks. They're modified Tasty. teeth. Um, they It is their left tooth. It erupts from their head and it can be up to eight feet long and it grows in a spiral pattern, it's which is why tooth. sometimes people think that they're fictional creatures or unicorns. So... <laughs> um, they also spend a lot of their life hidden under the Arctic ice, which means there's there's not a whole lot of narwhal studying going on except for postmortem. And so uh, there's a lot of kind of question as to what the tusk is used for. Is it for hunting? Is it for fighting? Is it for communication? Which is something I think we've talked about on this show before as well. But there's a new theory. And this study found, uh, searched through all sorts of reports of narwhals of head scarring, broken tusk, and tusks impaled in the sides of males. So a lot of aggression, tusk to tusk, with these narwhals. Another uh, set of scattered observations include a behavior called tusking, which is where two narwhals cross and rub their tusks together, which could also be some sort of communication during intra or intersexual interaction. So um, kind of male to male or trying to show off to communicate to a female. And so looking at kind of all this information, this longitudinal data, about 245 adult male narwhals were, were studied morphologically over 35 years to look at the size relationship of tusk with body size to try to figure out if there was some sort of larger communication going on with these tusks. And it does seem that these tusks are a form of sexual selection. Well, how did he decide this based on just measuring them? Well, they compared individuals of the same age, sexually, um, the same age, body size, and then they kind of measured these different pieces of them. They measured two things. They measured the tusk size, and they also measured the fluke size, which is the tail of the narwhals. So the idea was if one of these things is being sexually selected for, there would be a greater variation in those sizes for the narwhal. And they are fairly certain that the fluke is not a sexually selected trait. So it was a good kind of um, null hypothesis to use kind of. So they found that the male tusks can have over a fourfold variation in length. So the same body size males can have tusks that are one and a half feet long or 8.2 feet long. Wow. But the fluke is pretty much always the same size in relation to body size. They also found disproportionate growth in tusk compared to the fluke and have been able to say now they feel pretty confident that the tusk is a sexually selected trait. The information they're trying to give with that tusk is simple. I'm bigger than you. Um, this is common in sexually, sexual selection when um, it takes a lot of kind of nutrients and, and proof of a successful life to build a kind of erroneous trait. Think of your peacock feathers. So basically they're peacocking with their tusks. And they're saying not just that they're big, but they also are good at hunting, that they have good resources, that they are healthy. So this is their their kind of signal to the female that they are virile and they are a good choice. Of course, 
future in the future they would like to use aerial and aquatic drones to actually watch the tusk interaction in nature watch their role in sexual selection and in the aggressive behavior between males and see kind of what's happening there. Is it just male to male signaling? Is it male to female signaling? Is it both? So we need to see it still happen in real time, but it really looks like that tusk is really just for show. Hmm. So why did the narwhal have a tusk? For a good show. For a show. <laughs> to show off to the leaders. A tusk, a tusk for show. Mm -hmm. So fascinating that we, that there are these traits that grow to such extreme sizes that are only for show, that don't have a benefit that we can see aside from the ladies maybe, yep. or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the mating system happens to be, however it turns it, out. But it's so fascinating. I don't want to anger anyone. I don't want to kind of put anyone on blast, but this does always remind me of the people who work out the uh, kind of vanity muscles at the gym. Right. <laughs> the ones that are not really used for anything, but just look good. It's, it's kind of the, basically the same thing. Look at me. I'm strong. <laughs> look at me. Yeah. Look at me. Well, if anyone's looking at us right now, you'll know that it's time for us to move to the second half of the show. So we're going to take a very, very, very quick break. And this is a very, very, very quick break. We'll be back. Thank you for listening to Twists. You are the reason that we are able to do what we do every week. Bringing you up-to-date and down-to-earth views on science discoveries. And with your help, we can do even more. Together, we can bring a sane perspective to a world full of misinformation. Head over to twist.org right now. Click on the Patreon link and choose your level of support. Be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. Thank you for your support. We really couldn't do this without you. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. We are back. And do we have a This Week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately? lately? Yes, we do. Um, this actually got sent to me through Facebook. Awesome. <laughs> um, Randy Mazuka writes in, What has science done for me lately? The other day I used vinegar and baking soda together to make pizza dough without yeast. There uh, we, go. we were actually talking about how the stores are all out of yeast right now, but mm -hmm. everyone is all of a sudden baking bread because we have so much free time. He was able to use his knowledge of science to make bread despite a lack of yeast. Because what does baking soda and vinegar do, Blair? It makes a volcano for a science fair project. W pizza dough. <laughs> <laughs> Baking soda and vinegar react to release carbon dioxide, yeah, which can produce bubbles of air. Yeah, it's it's very it's similar, that. yes, yeah. to the fermentation process of yeast, right? Yeah, just like a volcano. Same thing. Yeah, like, just like yeah. a volcano. Just like a volcano. <laughs> Pizza dough volcano. Woo, that's my band. <laughs> <laughs> I love kitchen chemistry. I love... Yeah, that it's it's fun to play around. I mean, when you play around, you get a lot of failures, but you also have a lot of fun. And the successes are really, really good. Food mm -hmm. chemistry, it's great. Yeah, I made biscuits tonight with half normal flour and half whole wheat flour. Completely yeah. changed the consistency, but they were still mm -hmm. good. Yeah, whole wheat, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. I like whole wheat consistency. Yeah. They were Everybody's they were more like... kind of like solid. They were they yes. were less mushy. Than the normal ones. Ooh, yeah, Justin, you have to reboot you, his computer. <laughs> yes, you're going to have to uh, 
make some adjustments when you mm-hmm. add the whole wheat, but it doesn't necessarily. You can have light and fluffy whole wheat goods. I've had this them. is why I love baking because it is chemistry and mm-hmm. every kitchen is different. Your ambient air temperature is different. The, the moisture in the air is different. And so even if you use, if you follow the recipe perfectly, it is not going to turn out like it did in the cookbook. So it, you have to use deductive reasoning. And I love that. You're like, okay, yeah. next time I'm going to use less baking soda or next time I'm going to turn the oven down or next time I'm going to let it rise longer. You know, it just, mm-hmm. it's so, it's so fun. I love it. So fun. So mm-hmm. fun. And uh, let's all, let's all cook everyone. And you can tell us about your successes, your yes. failures, your experiments in the kitchen. I'd love to hear about them. Let us know what science has done for you lately. If you feel like writing in, please do send us an email. I'm Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. You can also write to us on Facebook because that's where you can leave us messages. Or if you're talking to Blair, just tell Blair and she'll put it in this part of the show. (laughs) You can also write us. Surprise! I'm like, hey, look, this part of the show came back. You can also just send us letters about cool sciencey things that you've thought about or ways that stories affected you in your life. What have you thought about this week to do with science? Let us know. We like to read your letters and your, have your input on the show. So please help us do that. All right. Is Justin back from rebooting? I do not think so. But we are going to move ahead. How about some stories about life? Mm-hmm. Thriving. In mm-hmm. places that you wouldn't expect. Like here right now, because I'm stuck inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. As so many people are stuck indoors and do not feel like they're thriving. In fact, the extroverts among you may feel like <laughs> you're wilting and withering away without human contact. Oh, I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> a little distance hug. I'll give you a hug from here. Yeah. I'm, I think, more of an introverted extrovert than people realize. I'm pretty okay hanging out, hanging out at home and only talking to people on the internet. <laughs> it's fine. But I know that some of you aren't feeling so great. But you know what? There are worse places in the world to be where life thrives. And it's such a surprise. Okay, so researchers... On this research boat, a vessel called the Joides, J-O-I-D-E-S, Resolution Research Vessel, they went out as part of an expedition of the International Ocean Discovery Program, expedition number 360. They traveled out into the ocean and they drilled below the ocean into the Earth's crust. In this one particular area, they came to an, uh, an area, it's called the Atlantis Bank. And this is a place that there's been massive uplift and the mantle lifted up this mountain range and it's about five kilometers above the seafloor that it extends, this flat top, this long bank that's that's under the ocean. But really what it's done, because of the way the mantle has pushed it up, it's allowed deeper crust to come closer to the surface. And so these researchers went, aha, we can take advantage of this. And so they drilled down. And previously, we have really only drilled down into the top layer of the Earth's crust. And when we've looked there in the rock of the top of the crust, we've seen bacterial life. We're like, hey, there's bacteria living in the rock, but that's fine. Of course there is, because it's so close to the ocean uh, right above it, or it's so close to the air and the land, and, you know, everything. it's close. It's fine. We can understand that there's some mixing and some turning, and the bacteria could be in there. But what about deeper down? I mean, it gets hot. There's amazing, incredible pressures the further deep, the, the further down you go underneath the surface of the earth. And so you wouldn't expect life to necessarily be able to exist in the lower crust. Well, they drilled down 809 meters below the crust, into the crust, and found that, yes, indeed, 
bacteria grew when they took these samples back to the lab into a sterile environment so that they made sure there would be no chance that bugs from the lab or other places could get in. They tested and they grew them and they published in the journal Nature that they had found DNA and RNA, fat molecules, all sorts of signatures of life. N not a ton of it, but it was there. They found bacteria deep, deep into the crust of the earth in a place that we wouldn't expect to find it. So now we think to ourselves, huh, super hot, incredible pressure, really extreme environment. Wow, microbes can survive in the craziest places. And this leads me to my next story, which researchers using data from the uh, from a mission that mapped mercury, they looked at data around the surface of Mercury, the planet that's closest to the sun. This was NASA's messenger spacecraft that scanned the surface of Mercury from for four years between 2011 to 2015. And they found that there's this type of terrain. We had pictures, but this really showed that there's this type of terrain, they call it chaotic terrain, that they think formed about 1.8 billion years ago. Two billion years after a massive impact event would have started processes that would have moved the interior of this planet and eventually caused a shift the way that you see ripples go along a pond or if you hit sand, eventually the sand moves further away from you, that ripples through the planet would eventually come out the other side. In this chaotic terrain, they have, through the scans, been able to determine that there is organic volatile, what they call crustal volatile rich elements in this layer. And so they think that these chaotic terrains are evidence that the interior of Mercury could have been, maybe not now, but could have been, even in the early phases, 1.8 billion years ago, when life was getting formed on our planet, that perhaps there was bacterial life, or at least conditions, could have allowed bacterial life to form inside on the surface of Mercury, the hottest planet closest to the sun. The place that you'd be, what? No life's going to be there. But it seems as though these volatiles were present, which would make that possible. Yeah, don't rule life out anywhere. No. <clears throat> it right. seems to be a, a theme that uh, we come to again and again on this show. I feel like someday... We'll be look on, looking back on it, laughing at ourselves, going, Psh, we thought there was only life on Earth. It's, it's everywhere. It's all yeah. over the place. Oh, silly things. Didn't even know it was right in front of them. Yeah. So, they, yeah, if they think this area, these crustal volatiles where they where these this chaotic terrain, that it's a size a, pro a little bit larger than California, about 500,000 square miles or 193,000, oh, sorry, 500,000 square kilometers, 193,000 square miles. And that uh, these volatiles, as magma spread through the interior deep, from deeper down, it caused this heat that allowed these volatiles to rise mm -hmm. to the surface. It's funny about that uh, thing you said there, Blair. About mm. one day we'll just be like, oh, yeah, of course there's life everywhere. That's what the ancient Romans believed. Yeah. They also, they also mm. thought the stars were planets, but still, and that there were people on all of those stars. But still, uh, they, they knew how far away the moon was. They knew how, how round the earth was to within about 10%. They were pretty, they were pretty on it. There you go. Scientific knowledge is a is a thing that uh, that has been with us sometimes much much longer than than we we think, and it and it produces some 
some actual results. Uh, this is, uh, I think we're, are we transitioning to the next story or did I interrupt? I can't tell sometimes. Transition. Okay. Uh, Scripps in uh, Research Institute has gone out of their way and looking at the novel SARS CO2 COVID-19, whatever you want to epidemic uh, thing that's going on. They published in the journal Nature Medicine. They looked at it and they have proclaimed that there is absolutely no evidence of genetic manipulation, purposeful human genetic manipulation. If that sounds like a, a weird thing to have to be telling people, the reason is conspiracy theorists have been suggesting mm -hmm. that this is a weaponized uh, strain that was intentionally created. It is not. Um, they uh, analyzed the genetic template for spike proteins. These little armatures on the outside of the virus that you see in all the little pictures uh, that used to grab the outer walls of animal cells and hang on. They focused on some important features of the spike protein, receptor binding domain, RBD, which is a kind of grappling hook that, that grabs into the host cell, and a cleavage site, a molecular can opener that allows it then to crack open and enter a cell. Uh, they found that the RBD portion of SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins have evolved naturally, effectively target a molecular feature on the outside of human cells called ACE2. If that sounds familiar, this is also a receptor that is involved in uh, regulating blood pressure, which has nothing to do with this story. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was so efficient at binding human cells, in fact, that the scientists concluded it was the result of this natural selection not a product of a genetic engineering that had all the when you do genetic engineering you you have a very we are very clunky in our technology it leaves obvious sort of six you can call them scars but that's not really what it is uh they they, sh they have obvious uh differences from what you would find in in nature so the evidence for natural evolution was also supported by data on its backbone, its overall molecular structure. Uh, if somebody were engineering this, it would have constructed it from the backbone of a virus that already existed. Uh, actually building a backbone from scratch is a little bit mm -hmm. outside of what we are able to do at the moment. Uh, they also found that uh, it, the backbone differed substantially from those of already known coronaviruses and mostly uh, resembled viruses found in bats and pangolins. Mm -hmm. So possible origins of the virus, still, they're not going to call it. Uh, they're saying bats and, and pangolins are potentially, uh, but, you know, could be another source that we haven't identified yet as well. Yeah, they think, I think they're really targeting bats, but then that there was maybe an intermediary between bats and humans and so yes. that's the question is was it a pangolin or was it one of these you know, civets or was, yeah. yeah was it something else yeah so uh in the chat room uh the youtube chat room there was a uh, discussion about whether or not mosquitoes can transmit the coronavirus uh so this is i took this from mosquito.org who you know if you're gonna ask a question about mosquitoes you go to mosquito.org. Uh, they, they, they just point out, uh, they have referred to the World Health Organization and the CDC. Uh, under the CDC, they say mosquitoes and ticks can't spread all types of viruses. At this time, we have no data to suggest COVID-19 or other similar coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, or anything like this can be spread uh, by mosquitoes or even ticks. So it, it, for, for it to pass through uh, mosquitoes as a vector, the virus must also be able to replicate while in the mosquito or tick. And as of yet, there is no evidence that that can take place. Uh, over on the World Health Organization site, though, there is also uh, a number of interesting myth busters advice for the public. Uh, here's a couple of them. They can be transmitted, uh, transmitted, transmitted in areas <laughs> with... Well, they originate from a hot, humid climate in the first place. So no, uh, just heat, adding heat is not going to, you know, turning your thermostat up really high 
or waiting for summer, these are not effective. Cold and, weather and and if don't put a blow dryer up your nose. Well, you don't, know what? Don't Anybody put a blow dryer up your nose, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> stop listening to the 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 internet. <sighs> stop listening Just to home remedies. Just a reminder remedies. that the internet also told you to eat soap not too long ago. So remember the whole Tide Pod situation. Yeah. I'm all just for, saying all, it's hey, not a great source for all medical for a good neti pot once in a while. Not a bad idea, but yeah, don't as long as it's distilled it. water or previously boiled. Yeah, don't put don't put that. What was the what were we talking about? fish tank cleaner in your no? Oh, no yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do not do that. So cold no. weather, cold weather also does not. Uh, Kill this fight. They can get down to very colder temperatures than are going to be inside of your body. Taking a hot bath does not prevent corona disease. <laughs> it cannot, according to the World Health Organization, cannot, based on the data, we have no evidence to suggest new coronavirus can be transmitted by mosquitoes. So mm -hmm. they're saying cannot be transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, the, by the way, I'm, I'm leaving out one element of each of these, which is at the end of every one of these myths that they bust, it says to protect yourself, clean your hands frequently with alcohol-based hand rub or wash them with soap and water. Wash your hands with seconds. soap and water. Mm -hmm. Wash your hands. Hand dryers. Oh, wait. Oh, no. We said hand dryers, uh, the hair dryer doesn't work? No. no uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> also, they're confirming, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It'll just dry Ultra, your hands. That's it. Yeah. Or, or uh, your hair. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet lights. Uh, they work on the outside, uh, and they should, but they should not be used to sterilize hands or other areas of the skin. It's because radiation can cause skin mutations. This is something for an aerosolized thing. This is something that's totally unrelated to putting your hands in. No, don't do that. The, I mean, I think the question is at this point, yeah, you should not be using UV lamps to sterilize yourself. But there is the potential, and people are using UV lamps to sterilize um, equipment and to sterilize walls of rooms. But there are health effects of UV radiation that people need to be concerned about. And and here's another weird thing with that. Just if you don't do it right, uh, what you do when you use UV incorrectly to sterilize is you, yeah, you kill don't... you kill some of the cells and they have an immediate nitrogen release as a result and other cells utilize that to grow faster so you also have to know what you're doing yes uh, don't spring, just do it know what you're doing bathing yes. yourself in chlorine or alcohol mm -mm. will do uh the the job in terms that what that soap and water would do it will do that job and nothing else. If it's in your body, it doesn't matter. If it's if it, but if you really you you, you will do less harm to your skin cells. And uh, if you just use soap and water, it's very effective. It's twenty seconds. That's all you need. Soap and water. It actually one of the bleach things about and this alcohol, is bleach and alcohol and soap and water. All these things stay on the outside of your body. And yes. bleach important should. Point. Bleach also will damage terrified. your skin. Do yeah. not use bleach on your skin right. um, and use the proper concentration of alcohol because alcohol will also damage your skin. So soap and water is really the best yeah. choice. And the reason it's the best choice is because this is uh, on the larger scale of a virus that can maintain a lipid layer around it. And lipid is fat mm -hmm. and soap uh, is one of the things that dissolves fat. So the entire exoskeleton, if you will, of the virus uh, is dissolved by your soap. And if you do 20 seconds worth of solution of water and soap, it actually break, it des it destroys, it breaks the virus down into uh, harmless components and then it can go down the sink and it doesn't matter. You don't have to disinfect your drain. Everything that uh, comes off of that soap and water mixture can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's the vaccines against pneumonia don't protect you against coronavirus. That's that's a secondary infections or, or a whole other thing. Rinsing your nose with saline, the neti pot. I thought I'm all for a neti pot, right? There is no evidence that regular rinsing of the nose with saline has protected people from the infection with the new coronavirus. Yep. Uh, so because that's nope. salt water, that's you know not the thing. Eating garlic, however, will give you nope. wonderful breath. Yes. <laughs> however, <laughs> not gonna help.
There's no evidence that <laughs> Kurt Albrecht is oh, eating boy. garlic. Uh, also, wearing blue this, shoes on a Tuesday will not prevent you uh, protect you from the coronavirus. Well, like antibiotics. This is a this is a long list. No, I'm sorry. This, no, no, this no. Is, it's this just is funny. Things yeah. that are out there. Yeah. Antibiotics uh, do not work against viruses. Okay, there's mm -hmm. no point in taking them. Antibiotics are for bacteria. For yeah. bacterial infections, viruses are not bacteria. Yeah, uh, and then and then the 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 biggest thing. I think out of all of these, when you take them uh, collective, is at the end of each one, it's wash your hands with soap and water. Like this is what, mm -hmm. this is what you need to do. Social distancing, is is, you know, when you're looking at the places that are the hardest hit, you're looking at places that have very dense populations that rely heavily on mass transit, that uh, have crowded streets and sidewalks. The reason why these diseases are taking off there is because social distancing is a little bit harder there than it is other places. If you're somewhere where social distancing is as easy as just being in your home, then, then by practicing that and the hand washing thing when you have to go out for the essentials is, or is all the steps you really need to take. I mean, yeah. And wash that, your hands. I mean, but that's why, yeah, well, that's, yeah. Again. As soon as you come home and then before you leave the house. Because we don't Wipe want down to your distancing. phone, wipe down your glasses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. And, 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 and uh, I, I should have bought a stock. I don't know what to buy. Uh, invest in probiotics because we're going to need them after all of this. Because we <laughs> haven't been touching anything for the longest. We're all going to get indigestion. We're all going to have irritable no, bowel. That's not this. true. We're going to be fine. Yeah. We are going to be fine. Well, uh, yeah. Define we'll fine make, later. Life, but... life finds a way. <laughs> and yeah, the other point. Uh, that's what I mean. Yes. The other point Whether or not you consider a virus life. We've we've life been here before. Away. We have been here before, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have. Is, is, this might be the first time this has happened in our lifetime, our parents' lifetime. Before that, there was a generation that went through. Two world wars, polio, and Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a Great Depression. Great Depression and the yeah. Great Depression <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. And we call them yeah. the greatest generation. Do you know why? Because they deserved it. They deserved <laughs> they something at the end of all of that. Right. Um, but there, there are a, there are a heck of a lot more of us now, <laughs> which does make it harder. But yes, we'll get through it. We will get through. Just like we're going to make our way through this show, this is This Week in Science, and if you want to help us grow, find a friend and get them to scribe, subscribe today. That's it. Everyone has time for a new podcast these days. Pick up This Week in Science. <laughs> yes. And on a musical note, we'll get into our quick stories here at the end of the show. I wanted to bring a musical story. In a new paper published in NeuroImage, researchers out of East China Normal University, they looked at uh, they looked at the brains of violin players while well, they played violin and scanned them, recorded those scans, and then they looked at the brains of people who were listening to watching the performance that the violinists played. They found that some of the people watching, these people in the audience, they, their brains were synchronized with the brains of the violinists. And in, it was in a very particular area of the brain, the left temporal lobe. And they found that over these some brief segments, sections of listening of 100 seconds, if the... The, synch the synchronization, the coherence, what they're calling interbrain coherence, happened in the second half of the music that they were listening to that the, the, the audience member liked it more. And so what they're suggesting is that synchronization of a person's brain will indicate their enjoyment of a particular performance or piece of music. Interesting. Yeah. So if your brain 
is lighting up in tune with the brain of the musician who originally performed it, you like their music. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I thought that I thought it was I thought it was pretty fun this idea these areas that are involved the, the left temporal cortex and then there's other areas the right inferior frontal cortex and post central cortices and they are involved in what's thought to be the mirror network where our brains and, and we've talked before on the show about mirror neurons the idea that there's like some aspect of social activity um in, in which our brain has has to go through the activation of or mirror the activation of another person to get social behavioral synchronization so that we can do things together like listen to music and dance or um, enjoy a speech or understand what people what people are doing or saying and and, and it's, it's yeah. such that we are actually experiencing it yeah. We're firing the like when uh, the yeah. the old studies when you watch somebody run, uh, your motor neurons that would normally be firing when you run are firing, <laughs> and it's a, it's a really weird thing that our brain is like mimicking like oh I know what that does. That's it, when is you, that why when I play a video game where I'm driving I always move. <laughs> yeah, you're actually <laughs> your motor neurons <laughs> are firing as yeah. Uh, there's as a there's a. There's a couple of uh, rides at Universal Studios, I think is the first time I experienced it. And they have them other places too, uh, where you're sitting in a chair that's not moving, but the screen has got motion and there's audio moving and you feel the sensations as though you're like actually going up and down, like you're on a roller coaster almost, even though you sit still. And part of that is your, your mind is firing off things, the sensations that we expect to be experiencing. Uh, and that, so, but yeah, yeah, that yeah. makes, that makes tremendous, uh, that makes tremendous sense. Cause there, mm -hmm. we've all experienced this. I think when you listen to a piece of music or a song or something like this, where, where you really feel like I, like the way I reacted to it is like, I, I could have written that if I ever thought of it, but whatever, like, I totally get that, that thing right there that they're doing. And I liked it. I know it. It's familiar for some reason, uh, and they've just brought you along for the ride. Yeah, but can you can and you can think about it? You know, in a even bigger sense than that is that as you're listening to it at you know some other time, or even as you're watching a performance and listening, that you're connecting with the brain of the performer <laughs> through the music that are mm -hmm. that through this expression of music, we are able to connect brain to brain with other individuals very cool very cool right nice. what's up next um i have one last blair sops fable yes oh, yeah, Brian. why did the female live longer in all human populations average lifespans are always longer for women than men nine out of ten super centenarians people over 110 are women and it is also true for other mammals. Looking at demographic data for 134 populations of 101 mammalian species, they found that in 60% of cases, female mammals live longer. 18.6% longer. That is a long time longer. It's a fifth, almost a fifth of your life longer. So of course in humans, it's about 7.8% longer. It's not that long. But on average for mammals, 18.6% longer. But the why, the whole fable of it all, we actually don't know. <laughs> it could be because <laughs> male mortality rises faster with age, but that's, you know, that it doesn't look like that because about for half of the populations that were studied, the mortality with age is more pronounced among females, actually. So that's that, that can't be it. But mortality risk is lower among females at all ages. So it could just be that females are less at risk of death on the whole. And so they live longer. Why? We don't know. But it's true for all animals. We are not special. Or all mammals. <laughs> we are not special. Yeah. Well, actually, 
women, then we are special. We get to live we are longer. We're special. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That second X chromosome really got the jackpot, at least with lifespan, maybe not with many other things, but <laughs> lifespan. <laughs> Which we you got more important to me. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have apes, Justin? You know, uh, my reboot uh, has uh, obliterated my my story. It was an Australopithecus story. that some investigation into the vertebrate of a three million year old fossil that uh, found that the blood flow at that point was closer to, to the brain, was closer to chimpanzees than it is modern humans. Um and that its skull was uh, structured very much uh, more more like I have the link in there if anybody wants to go read the story, but that the uh, that the morphology was very much closer to ape like. So this is an interesting thing we've talked about it in the past on the show. Uh, there was one hypothesis put forward that running led to bigger brains because there was microfluidic pumping of these fleshy feet as we ran for great long distances and of blood flow to the brain also the cooling uh, the the skull and the and the head so but also adding nutrients to that brain area as we did so and this is we got this bigger hole that sort of evolved in the base of the skull that allowed for larger veins to come through so this may have been how we did it and there was this other interesting research where there's this uh the sort of bony ridge if you feel at the back of your head You've got this little sort of ridge line back there, this little bony outcropping. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tendon under there that keeps your head sort of pointing forward when you run. And most running animals have this tendon. Uh, dogs, horses, uh, cheetahs, whatever, anything that's running around. Pigs don't have it. Apes don't have it. They're not big runners. Humans have it. So there's this really interesting thing. And then they, they went from there and they looked and they found all these other things. And it was starting about 2 million years ago-ish with Homo erectus that we start we had evolved into a like runner. We got the tendon shows up. We got the, the longer toes. We got the or shorter toes. We got the arches in the feet. We got all these morphologies that, uh, that worked. So it's really interesting to me, the Australopithecus, still not a runner. Still had a head position that looked more like it was a tree climber. Yeah. Uh, and, and not moving. So somewhere in that, there was a million years there where there's this big jump into being a persistence hunting runner. Uh, losing the much of our, our body hair so that we can sweat. Where are uh, those fossils? So, so <laughs> no, but what, like, where, what it, where are all those dead bodies? What it, what it, <laughs> well, there, that's a great question. And the thing is, there's a, the thing that the first thing in this that jumped out is like, oh, wait, what if Australopithecus ain't even a cousin? I mean, is just a distant cousin, isn't Did, even yeah. part of, what, is this, yeah. what if it's not yeah. even part? What if there's another, another runner who was already starting running before this? Because that to add this tendon and, and all the art, the sort of little morphological changes, they they show up, yes. But I, I feel like there must have been something or somebody out there that was running that uh, might not have gotten the brain yet, but might have had some of the other skill sets already started. So it's really kind of an interesting tie into all these other stories that we've we've talked yeah. about in the past. Uh, yeah, that uh, Australopithecus looks a little, little more apish. Not, not so mannish. The other thing that's kind of funny: we lose hair all the places we need to sweat. This is this is not it, this is not documented anywhere. But, but yeah, the fact people that still humans... have to de de depilate. De 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 how do you say the word? Depilate. De de take their hair off. Well, well no, but the <laughs> uh, but one of the things that occurred to me because we need to be cooler. They're, they're um, this, is, this is Justin hypothesizing all out on a limb, but that facial hair might have stuck around because when we're running, we're breathing heavily with our <sighs> right, and so this area might have been cooler than the rest of the body and didn't lose the hair because of it. Interesting. Yeah. 
possibilities. Well, you know why we still have hair in our armpits and in our groinal region and all those areas, right? It's I've, there's there's different theories, but my biology professor, like second day of class, is like, hey, here's why we have pubic hair. It's <laughs> it's to hold your sweat and collect your pheromones. One and two, friction. Oh, also, also the uh, the other big implication yeah. of all of this running studies, the, you know, hold the pheromones. The other big mm -hmm. implication of those, all these running studies is that uh, running uh, requires a butt. It does. Butt, butt mm -hmm. doesn't come into action when you walk, but when you run, butt gets yep. real involved, real involved in when you're interesting. running. Interesting. Which which is interesting also because there had been a theory a long time ago that butts came about because uh, because apes can show sexual changes when in their in their uh, when they're mm -hmm. ovulating mm -hmm. and yes. humans can't. So the butt was meant to replace this uh, some sort of no, no, it probably has nothing to do with anything. It's probably just required for running. Yeah, I'm pretty no. sure my butt looks the same whether I'm ovulating or not. No, it does. <laughs> if, if you were an ape, it would look very different. I know, if you were an ape, but that's it would my look point. Very different. And on that <laughs> note, thank have you. you. Did, have you really been checking? <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think we've made it to the end of our yeah, show. Yeah, we did. We did it. Thank you for listening. I'd love to give some shout outs. Fada, thank you for your help on social media with show descriptions. And uh, Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you to Paul Disney, Ed Dyer, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Ed, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Bizarros, Bob Calder, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Mark Hessenflow, Ashley Doyle, Maddie Perrin, Ben Bignell, Justin Taylor P.S., Josiah Zaner, Howard Tan, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Picararo, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, Mountain Sloth, Cecil Gradney, Stephen Elberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zugner, Eculuses, Adkins, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Trapo, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert Gregg, Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Ed Lucet, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and E.O. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just click the Patreon link at twist.org. Oh, on next week's show... We will be back uh, on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Uh, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org live. We'll be all of these places next week. We promise. And it's going to be April Fool's, but we will be here. We will be. Promise. Here. Yes. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoy the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. As I previously mentioned, they all have some extra time. Get them to subscribe yeah. to Twist. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter, which we might be putting out at some point. Yeah, yeah, at some point. Because we all have more time now. Yeah, um, you can contact us directly. Also, you can email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure, no matter what else you do, to put twist, T-W-I-S, in that subject line, or your email, it's going to go straight <laughs> spam, spam filtered <laughs> into oblivion. <laughs> You can also hit us up on Twitter where we are at Twist Science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news.
And if you've learned anything from the show today, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, disclaimer and it shouldn't be news that what I say may, may not, not represent, represent your views. views but I've done the calculations and I've got it now a Blair's plan. frozen if you listen to the science you may just yet understand that we're not everybody's frozen everybody's frozen everybody's frozen and this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Got a laundry list of items I that I want to address. address. From stopping global hunger to <laughs> dredging Loch Ness. I don't even know I'm the words. trying word. to promote more, more rational thought. thought. And I'll try to answer All any the questions, questions you've got. got. So how can, can I ever see the changes, changes that I see that I when I can only set up shop one hour a week or two or three? This science is coming your way. way. You better just listen to, to what, what I say. Please just remember that it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. I don't think I've karaoke'd all the way through that for a while. At least not with the <laughs> microphone on. <laughs> yeah. If not now, when? Exactly. When? When? Oh my God, I'm tired. Me too. Yeah. So all this news about people spending time at home, being bored. What? I have no... I just, I'm I? home all the time. I May have I all the work to do still. <laughs> because I'm not bored because I'm still working full time. And working. Uh, yes. I'm actually busier because things are harder to do from home. Um, I'm trying to reinvent things to be virtual that were never meant to be virtual. Ne never. Yeah. I get it. But I am also troubled. So I think... Some people are using the word bored incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I think they're having trouble characterizing their emotions. I really think that's what's going on. <laughs> so it's not using, it's not, it's not the word bored is, it's just they're using the wrong word. Yes, that's, that's my opinion. They, as an, as an extroverted extrovert, <laughs> extrovert, extrovert, I'm having trouble. I started having trouble on day three of this. 
<laughs> and it is because at my job, when I need to recharge, you know, introverts recharge by spending time on it. I recharge mm -hmm. by walking over to my coworker's desk and complaining about an email I got or asking them what they did last weekend or whatever. And like when we start laughing, like touching them on the shoulder. Right. And like, this is part of what keeps me going as a human. <laughs> and I can't touch people. <laughs> I have to text someone if I want to share like a current commiserate about something and they don't always get back to me right away. And I, the most social I have been in the past two weeks is I played Mario Kart and I had a Google Hangout at the same time with someone I was playing Mario Kart with. That was That's the most good. social thing I've done, which felt amazing because it mm -hmm. like you're looking at the screen. So you're not look you're not looking at the Google Hangout. You just have your friends voices in your ear while you're playing a video game. So it almost feels normal. It almost feels like you're in the same room. Right. But like yeah it's it's been very it's been very hard i just want to i want to hug <sighs> it's just i see my neighbors who I, I don't even know their names and nor do i usually care about them really like i say hello we chit chat but now there's this weird thing where you like say hey how's it going from like 10 feet away and then you leave <laughs> it just feels so i walked um i walked a trail on monday on my day off I walked this old uh, highway that's now a walking trail. And it was, people were very good. There was not a lot of people there. But like normally when you walk a trail, I feel like 50-50 someone's going to say hello to you when you pass. But this one, 100%. Everybody said uh Hi. was like oh hey how's it going oh hey how are you okay oh, have a good day like everyone's so starved I feel like it's pretty funny yes I know I'm complaining and I live with a fiance and a dog and I'm very thankful for both of them <laughs> <laughs> except you're on opposite schedules yes, so, so when you want co to talk and stuff he's sleeping or yes. when oh. you're like he or you're or you're awake and yeah you're awake he's sleeping or the opposite yes and then so you, yesterday you cross in between yeah I woke him up early because I was having a really bad day and so I had to like push him away and be like uh, I need you to be up with me for a minute <laughs> <laughs> oh. so yes I do live with someone else but we only get about three hours in common a day <laughs> so that's interesting um, but yes I have a dog I'm very happy I have a dog right now because I don't think I'd get as much fresh fresh air as I'm getting if I didn't have the dog because I have to go outside yeah. like six times a day you have to go outside. Yeah. Although I haven't been outside today. I do have a porch, <laughs> which I have been using the heck out of my porch. It randomly rained yesterday. But other than that, it's I've been using my porch a lot. Nice. No social distancing in Linden, huh? Yeah, there are lots of places where there's no distancing. Yeah. Oh, I found it. I found it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your 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 school bus. How's your school bus? Uh, school bus is coming along. Uh, my schoolie. Uh, I got it parked out on a farm. I had to. It's apparently my hot spot, which works for everything else. Last week we found out tragically does not operate efficiently on the bus with this platform. I think it would have worked fine with Google Hangouts, because uh, it went to. We all went to a server that then broadcast. Uh, but this go has to ping you, Kiki, and then come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why this platform didn't work properly on the hotspot. Even though I have the LTE and everything that they said should work and the, the uh, frequently asked questions uh, segment. No, work. no, because I used a hotspot at the, uh, at the Cal Academy. When we were all together, though. So, so we all had to ping to where you were for it to go out. No, it uh, goes to no, it goes to their server. I don't know. I think I had there was some weird thing where I don't know. I will I will state unequivocally I don't know why it didn't work. The frequently <laughs> asked questions thing said it should have worked. 
Yeah, it, that's yes. what, it should it should have worked. Were you using the right browser? Yeah, I was using the same everything that I always everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my phone's hotspot to run the laptop is sufficient to do normal streaming, normal uh, FaceTimey stuff. Mm -hmm. All of that has worked flawlessly in the past. Fascinating. Uh, I don't know why it didn't work. Let's Fascinating see stand up. Oh, yeah. We should investigate. Um, however, the other however, problem I'm having yeah, is I'm on a day. farm out in the country, and my nearest neighbors are chickens. Which Blair always <laughs> thinks that that's what <laughs> that's where I live. It's actually true now. Now for real. Now for real. I'm finding social distancing to uh, sort of be the default. Not a thing I'm having to adjust to at this point. Although, although, this was not the plan. I'm, I'm right now. I'm supposed to be back in Denmark. Right. I know. So, so you're stuck here for a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So your significant yeah. other, you get to see three hours I a day. Do. Aren't you lucky? I know. Aren't you? Aren't you? I know. Just, well, that's the other thing we've I been am talking so about. Jealous. Is if we lived separately, this. still, if we didn't live together. I wouldn't be able to see him right now because he's working in hospitals. He shouldn't. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be yeah. able to see him. Jeez, so yeah. the fact, like, I kind of, you know, lucked out, if you want to call it that. In that, yeah, you are. I have to be here. So lucky. To... So I'm gonna, you know, his germs are my germs right now, which is a bummer. But also, I don't have to go several weeks without seeing him. So yeah, that's yeah, that sucks. It mm -hmm. really does. Yeah. It really does. Ugh. So many, so many different things and not cool things right now that we're having to get used to. Pretty crazy. But yeah. I mean, part of the problem is like, I keep seeing that post about it's like we're all kindergartners who keep losing five more minutes of recess. Like, that's part of the problem is we're not all doing it. It's, right. It's counties or states are making these decisions, but it's not Separately. blanket. Yeah. So they all have different dates to like even the school districts in the Bay Area all have different dates for going back right now. None of them are back yet, but they all have different estimated return dates for school. So I think that's part of the problem, too, is if you're trying to really do this, you know, I don't want to have done this for nothing. Let's. <laughs> Let's all do it. If we're going to do it, do it. <laughs> so yeah. do it halfway. Um, Gaurav Sharma in the chat room is asking, saying, who went grocery shopping today for the first time since since March 10th? Should I, wipe every, <laughs> should I wipe every single object I bought? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is, this is like the, this is a great question because mm -hmm. I too have considered this. Uh, I, I think, first of all, like, it's great that all the people that you interact with now are wearing gloves. Good for them. Problem is, if they've touched everybody right. else's cards, stuff, whatever, they're not, they're not changing gloves between customers. <laughs> this is how you would actually yeah. do a sort of a non-transfer thing. They're actually becoming vectors as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so but they're that. not getting themselves sick is what they're trying right. to do. So really. here's, here's the, here's the thing that you can do that I have tried to do to some degree, which is when you do go buy stuff from public environment, uh, wash once you hands. buy, well, wash your hands. Yeah. But also, also you need to be thinking ahead a little bit, which means a little bit of hoarding maybe, but, tr but put those items aside. Like, wear your gloves if you've got them to, when you go out in public. Put all of those things aside if it's got, uh, if it's a metal uh, container or a plastic container. Don't touch it for three days. Put it somewhere in your store. Don't put it in the garage. Just leave it there for three days. That'll be fine. If it's something that's in a cardboard box, don't touch it for 24 hours. If, it's, the if it's produce, if it's food, wash it. Yeah, yeah, wash it in soap and water. And then if you wash want to your use hands. it right away and wash your hands, but the, and don't touch your face like these things. 
But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I, I don't think you necessarily need to wipe everything down. Uh, you don't need to. If you've got the supplies to do it, go ahead. It'll make you feel more confident. But but also just having like a a outside world, like a, a you know the like an airlock, right? It's like an airlock. Like you take stuff, you bring it in the garage, you have the state, you stage it. That I don't touch for three days. That I don't touch for two days. That tomorrow will be fine. And and you can you can do these things if you're concerned with it. I wouldn't go to the point of again putting product. Don't bleach your apples. Don't do like there's like there's unnecessary steps where you can take these things too far. Yeah. The biggest thing. Do the what feels thing, good to you. Like if you. No 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 no. Like, don't do what feels good to you. That's the. What? It's because most pe- that's for us in this room. Wash in your this hands chat, with soap and water. Yeah, that will make us feel good. Beyond yeah. that, there's things that might other make other people feel good. That, okay, well, that's I'm what extrovert. I'm saying. Like, if you want to wipe down your stuff and it makes you feel better and safer, do that. But if you if you want to stage okay. an airlock, like you're talking about, yeah. where you let things sit for a couple of days, yeah. do that. Let them sit. Yeah. Find the thing that works for you, that makes you feel at less that that is logically putting yeah, you at, 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 an, at an acceptable amount of risk for yourself. I mean, this is, it's, it's, and then wash your hands with soap and water. Also, remember, we are all going to get it. <laughs> right. That's we're trying not, to not all get it at the same time. That is yeah, the whole and, point mm-hmm. of this. It's this is this is uh this is uh, uh what do you classic uh what is it the uh, <laughs> it's a cruel rabbit. test two days of not opening that bag of chips yeah <laughs> that's true it is <laughs> cruel <laughs> this is but this is classic turtle in the hair okay uh the slower pace that we go at this the the more likely when when before we have to re-enter society there is a vaccine or there is a treatment a or treatment there's or something yeah there's a tool in the bag uh, the satchel side bag that isn't here now so what if it, what you're really trying to do is just not get it now not be the first one to try the new drug or mm-hmm. to try the new try the new virus you never want to be the first person to try the new virus. This is a tip. <laughs> yeah. The other side of it also is um, like I was reading some excerpts from the World Health Organization press conference and their uh, uh, Teatro, Dr. Teatro, is that his name? The the doctor, one of their da- main doctors. Um he was saying that part of what we're doing right now, that the long, slow, like what we do is we get rid of the first peak, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we pass the first peak. And what that does, we flatten the curve. This buys us time. Yes. And what our governments should be doing, what the federal, state, and local governments should mm-hmm. be doing during this time that we're buying is developing an action plan mm-hmm. for the next emergence of the virus so and buying and making respirators yeah so then and that includes what it what it includes is figuring out uh making sure that there are enough tests so that you can adequately test everybody so that you can do uh tracing and backtracking of individuals and then uh formalizing quarantine procedures to put people who have been exposed and who have the virus in quarantine so that they're not getting in contact with other people. Um, Making sure that we also have, uh, that the hospitals are set up so that they have the ventilators, so that they have the beds, so that it, it, what it necessitates is, okay, we messed up, we lost February, we didn't get active, you know, whatever happened to the tests, whatever, let's all do our social distancing right now. We are now buying the government time to put the plan in place so that next time, the social isola- isolation isn't as drastic so that we don't have to go to these extreme measures. Yeah. Uh, That's the plan. So, so an aspect of that. But I don't that, think our government's going to do it. But anyway. Right. So an aspect <laughs> of that, that, well, like Italy stopped worrying about tracing uh, mm-hmm. uh, because it got so bad in a region where they're just like, okay, we're just going to, anybody with symptoms, it's about hospitalizations, it's about treatment. The testing doesn't, the, vec- the tracing doesn't matter anymore. The thing to, the, contemplate about the United States right now 
is we we think of ourselves as one country. Most of the media reports you were hearing about this are slightly more extreme than most of the territory of the United States really requires. But most of the population should be because high density populations, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, are, are, uh, New Orleans are, are affected because of population density. The thing to recall about this, why tracing and testing is still absolutely required is because for a lot of the country, it's not as affected as those places. In New York, tracing doesn't matter now. Now it's about... Tra oh, yeah, now it's... Yeah. <laughs> I like that he froze with his hands up. It's good. Yeah. yeah, now... Yeah, it's not about tracing in New York. They've got too big of a problem now, but... Yeah. yeah. He's been talking this whole time. But it's late and you can do those things. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to stop. But, but the, <laughs> we have to treat the United States as if it's different scenarios in different parts of the country. It's not going to, there's places throughout mm -hmm. the country where testing is absolutely necessary. There's places where testing isn't the thing that's going to help anything. That the social distancing has to be absolutely <laughs> extreme. Yeah, it has to be extreme. Yeah, some places it has to be more extreme. Other places, not quite as extreme. Yeah. He's breaking up all over the place. But you can't, you can't have... Yeah. Uh, but you can't open up the clubs in Des Moines. Well, Des Moines probably hit. God, I don't know where it isn't hit. <laughs> you don't want to... Because it's got to be universal. We got to all do it at the same time. That's the best way for it to work. Yeah. Gaurav, I am in kind of a mood. All right, my internet stinks. I'm going to... Yeah, and I've got a headache and I need to go to bed and I'm running a conference tomorrow. Oh, so no. I need to go get my... I've been... <laughs> I'm in charge of a conference tomorrow, so I need to go to bed and be ready for my conference. Okay. And I still have emails to send people and things to organize oh, and I'm geez. very tired. And my eyeball, I want to put an ice pick through my eyeball. Oh, boy. Yeah. But okay. I'm not going to. I'm going to go pop a couple of uh, ibuprofen yeah. <laughs> and go to bed. Take some ibuprofen PMs. <laughs> yeah. Then you'll wake up in eight hours a new woman. Yes. Well, I'm going to go right. upstairs, gargle salt water, put a hot, hot compress on my face. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe do a little steam inhalation and then go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Did you freeze? I'm here. Oh, he, he froze. Good night, Kiki. <laughs> Thank you. Even though we never were in, in physical space in, before, oh. now I wish we were. Goodbye. Yeah. I miss you. Good night. Have I miss you conference. too. Thank you. And yeah, I'm doing. I'm gonna do a conference tomorrow, and it'll be awesome. And then I'll have the weekend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It'll be the weekend soon, everyone. Happy science to us all, Blair. You can make it. You I can, can do, do it. this. I'm getting. Creative. You can do this. Yeah. Yes. Go ask. Go ask Heather and JoJo to inv invite you to dinner on their street. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. That's great. <laughs> I do need to contact them. Yeah. Will do. Okay. Sure. Everybody out there. Thank you so much for watching us. Thank you for joining us for our show and our post show discussion. And we really look forward to seeing you again next week because as we're talking about, and so many people out there are talking about, we really de need this kind of connection and we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you for sharing this time. Have Stay a great safe. Week. Wash your hands. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying See it. See you soon. Next week.